I've got an upsetting news for you, Mr. Mitchell, said oncologist in a tone devoid of any emotions. David never thought that the words telling him he had less than six months to live would be uttered so casually and routine. Sick man's eyes went wet, and he felt with a distinct clarity that he desperately wanted to live. Things that previously seemed non-essentially indiscreet then had begun to take on a new special significance for him. The taste of a favorite tea or the rustle of the favorite book's pages in his state brought him great pleasure. Don't I have even a chance? Asked David quietly. Well, young man, we always have a chance, and a hope dies last, you know. The doctor answered, with both interested, burying into some documents. David realized with a sorrowful clarity that the oncologist was lying. However, he didn't show it, and in contrary, tried to play along. Yes, you're right. I should fight again and again for my life. In fact, he wanted to take on the most important thing in this situation, namely to settle all the nuances of the real estate he had, to formalize all the documents, and to draw up a testament. It sounded stupid, obviously. A man was almost 40 years old, and he already had to prepare for death. David left the clinic without even buttoning his jacket, and absolutely fearless to peace in autumn wind. After all, for someone who was doomed to die from rapidly increasing tumor, a common cold could do nothing. David had completely forgotten his way home. Everything was a blur. He was getting hot and cold in turns. His heart was pounding insanely, and the chest pains become unbearable. To the man's big surprise, a note on the table was waiting him at home. In his wife's handwriting, or written words, which were the best way emphasizing her attitude towards him. David, I left for business. Reheat the lunch yourself. Don't forget to take out the trash. I'll be late. Dry and succinctly. No kind words to you, which their lives were so filled at the beginning of their acquaintance. Of course, what was the matter in getting mushy with the person who was turning into a living corpse in front of you? Margaret and he lived together almost ten years. David, from a modest philological student, had become a writer, with whose name reckoned in literary circles. His books sold out like hotcakes. Bookstores put his novels on a bestseller list, rightly expecting record sales. It was saying that David had never let down the tycons of the book business, steadily publishing three books per year. He was confidently keeping the lights on, his head was full of ideas and images, and he looked forward to the future with the confidence of a person doing what he loved. At first, these were rare, mostly in mornings, episodes of chest pain. Over time, those episodes occurred to happen oftener, and at one point, the interval between onsets reduced to a microscopic amount. Screening showed the tumor, size of an apple. David's wife took the news of his disease stoically, without shedding a single tear. What's the point in crying if he was doomed? Margaret was concerned about much more important things. His account in the bank, their country house, and a car which had long been transferred to use. As a pragmatist, she has instantly calculated all the possible benefits from the likely death of her husband. Her eyes rounded when she had imagined how his book sales would rise in such a case. Did she love him? Hardly. It was probably just convenient to live with him. Exactly convenient, since David provided her with a comfortable life, full of secular events, flashes of television cameras at the moments of releasing of his new novel, and also the attendance for every hot spot in the city. She could eat dinner in New York and meet the dawn already in Chicago. With the help of a magic bank card, she turned into a fairy, for who almost nothing was impossible. Margaret understood perfectly that after David's departure to another world, she would yet be able to bask in a rays of glory, getting the profit out of his book's publishing. She cared only about the fact that David's health was getting worse, but he hadn't finished the novel that promised to cause a real boom in book publishing industry yet. Was coming back from another voyage through the boutiques of the city, she decided to clear the air. Darling, I pulled my strings and found an awesome painkiller for you. You know, for you to keen on and working on your book. You understand you should finish it. It's spoken that it is possible to live for years with your disease. What's the point of wallowing? 
in a tone broken no objections, said Margaret. David sighed in hopelessness and hunching over went to his cabinet. The medicine indeed was good. It took the pain off immediately and for a while. Nevertheless, every day the dose of the drug taken became bigger and bigger, causing addiction. However, Margaret wasn't confused at all. Replenishing the drug daily, she greedily watched as David's manuscript added thickness. Once in the late evening, her husband became very ill. Neither medicine nor the fuss of Margaret who had to call ambulance helped. The duty doctor examined the ill one and asked, What was exactly your husband taken? As a response to it, Margaret demonstratively pointed at empty package of medicines. Doctor's eyes rounded, and he exclaimed in anger, Are you going to kill him? In his condition it is a pure poison, which aggravating his situation. I had urgently transported Mr. Mitchell to the hospital. But what about my husband has a job, then finished book? With her hands out, yelled Margaret. Only Doctor's insistence undermined her plans. Just five minutes later, David was in emergency chariot that was rushing with all speed towards the hospital department. That night, the man was born the second time, and the doctors of the oncology department did impossible. In the morning, the pale and haggard, David was visited by his attending physician. I'm Rachel, Rachel Brooks, said young woman sitting down the bed. Thank you. I know that without you, I would have been writing book at another world's table. David answered, smiling with an effort. To let you know, I have read your books. At home, I've got the whole collections of them. Rachel exclaimed, still clutching the patient's story in her hands. The noise of opening door interrupted the conversation. Like an angry harpy, Margaret ran into the ward. David, how are you? Feeling better? Come on, start working, my dear. I'm begging you, please. Lie or not, but the novel won't write itself. Faking the empathy his wife saying. As if Rachel wasn't there, she continued. Oh, by the way, I almost forgot. I was at notary today. Take the documents and sign it here. Don't you want to leave me on the streets, darling? Do you? After what, Margaret put some papers to the husband. From which content, he got only that from the time the disposition of all his property and bank account would go to Margaret. Gathered the remnants of his strength, David put his autograph with a bare hand. Margaret instantly changed in a face and waltz out cheerfully chirping about her urgent affairs. Mr. Mitchell, you can't just be like that. Why do you bury yourself ahead? You still have a chance, believe me. The writer answered with an ironical smile and just pulled a plug on it. Since then, Rachel started to visit her patient. At the beginning, she came for a few minutes, then for a half an hour, and after a while, she spent half a day next to him. They spoke for hours about books, the world around, and just about everything existed. David was awaited overcoming more than have taken so essential dose of his painkiller. A special bond, noticeable for others and looser for those two, had set between them. Once she brought a newspaper clipping with an article of about absolutely new experimental drug, which was showing amazing results in response to various oncological diseases. David supported the idea of it, but when he saw the six-figure sum on the cost of the medicine, his eyes went out. I would never collect this amount of money, Rachel. The writer said doomed. Nevertheless, Rachel had it right to his wife and described the essence straight to her. What tripe, young lady? Selling all the property and end up with nothing. He's going to die, don't you understand? Such a waste of money. Excuse me, not. Leave me out of it, please. I do not want to participate in your adventures, said Margaret with a rock-hard voice. How could you say so? Isn't he your husband? He has a talent. It must be showed off for the people, exclaimed Rachel angrily. You know, how's you, Rachel, right? Get out of here! Hurry up! I will decide by myself what matters for David, and what doesn't. Now he should finish the novel. That's primary. Tell him so. Margaret replied, with all her appearance making it clear that the conversation is over. Meanwhile, David was getting worse every day. 
His eyes rolled and in the features of the approaching Denuma clearly appeared on his face. Rachel couldn't bear to see his torments, so she decided to make a desperate action. After calling the real estate office, whose representatives has long offered to sell her cozy house in Main Street, she agreed to the sale. Why was she the only one in such palace? Her husband died in a car accident and she hadn't kids yet. Bargain was quickly processed. Money was transferred to the bank account, but the amount was clearly not enough to pay for medical treatment. Rachel was desperately trying to find the solution and came up. She organized the website to collect monetary aid for David. She was sending his illness history to many charity foundations all day long. And one day the necessary sum dropped onto the account. It had turned out that the writer's admirers weren't only in the USA, but even abroad. Finally, the day came when everything had to be solved. The medicine was injected into David's emaciated body. Now, it was just a matter of waiting. With a fainting heart, Rachel was constantly by his side. By the evening, she finally noticed that cheeks gained color and his look had been cleared up. By the morning, he could already joke, even though he was still sick. The results of next examination showed wonderful effect. Full recovery was still a long way off, but there was tangible progress in treatment. A month after, David was discharged from hospital. He didn't come back to the person who had become a stranger to him during the past time. With the last money, with his savior, the rider rented a trailer on wheels, located on the outskirts of the city. With the help of the woman doctor, David Mitchell finished writing his book, and now he's preparing it for the release. He left all his property to Margaret and started a new life. The ex-wife did not want to give consent to the divorce, but after seeing the amount of the commission fee from the sale of his new novel, she agreed to any condition. David has undergone a rehabilitation course and lives in a world full of love and harmony, waiting with Rachel to replenish the family.